Good morning, good morning. Let's open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much. Help me, Lord, to get through this lesson and it'll be honoring and give you honor and glory. Be with us and help us with this lesson. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay. Genesis 15, another whole chapter. Uh, we'll, we'll get through this whole thing today. It's a pretty straightforward chapter about God's covenant with Abraham, which will also be extended to Isaac and Jacob. And it's an everlasting covenant. Uh, that's a beauty. It's, a, it's one of the few that's called an unconditional covenant. It means that we as, our, as the people, uh, and in this case, uh, the Jewish nation, doesn't have to do anything uh, for this covenant. That it's God's a promise from God, and nothing that uh, Israel will do or won't do will stop this covenant from happening. So let's get some verses up here and get into it. So I got this picture up here. This is the picture for this. This covenant chapter is uh, 12 through 20, so it's it's quite a bit in here. It's kind of a neat little picture. Uh, that's Abraham, obviously, or Abram, I should say. And it's got, uh, I was thinking about a picture to show this covenant. And this actually has it in it, so a part of it. So that's why I chose it. And speaking of, I'm thinking about it, I didn't get my pointer. So let me get my pointer. And... Okay, got my pointer. So, let's get some verses going here. And start hearing chapter uh, 15, verse 1. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and that steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? I didn't look into why that's there. I, I, I forgot about that now, and I just read it again. I don't know uh, who this Eliezer of Damascus is. It's just somebody who's with him, I guess. Uh, but that uh, basically he's talking here about the fact that uh, he has no, oh, this is the only young person, I guess, that's in the house. And that he hasn't have a childless. And he was told by when he first headed out, Abram did, uh, from the era of Chaldeans, that, uh, that he was going to have a de descendants as there are uh, the stars of the sky. And that's why you see him kind of looking off in the stars over there. See all the stars up here. And uh, you can almost see something we're going to see here. It almost looks like a, something I'm going to show you in a map. Because uh, uh, you got the Dead Sea right there. I mean, I, no, that's actually Jewish. No, that's Israel right there. Uh, and this would be the, uh, basically, this would be the Mediterranean Sea. So you can kind of see a, a very basic map of uh, Israel, of the Promised Land. And early Chaldeans would be down here someplace, where my pointer is. I'll show you a better map than that, but that's the, that's the painter did to try to sim symbolize uh, the promised land. So this covenant we're going to talk about is a covenant. Uh, uh, and typically in this culture, the covenant was uh, was done uh, with the, uh, with the uh, it was sealed with blood. Remember as kids uh, going back to childhood, remember the old, uh, I don't know if you, those that might be old enough, they used to have a thing called a uh, uh, blood brother or uh, where you would actually prick your finger and get it to bleed a little bit and uh, and your friend would too and you, you kind of put your fingers together that you were going to become blood brothers. I don't know, maybe just think of that, but that, uh, in, in somewhat the same way that this covenant is sealed with blood. I also want to talk about this particular passage uh, in another way. It says, uh, And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless and the steward of my house to Eliezer of Damascus? What I want to point to, though, is Lord God. It's one of the first places it's, uh, again, mentioned. And I thought about, uh, I read some uh, uh, great commentary on that word. So I thought I would mention that uh, 
to fully understand that term Lord God. And here in this particular, uh, Lord stands for Adonai, or Adon, uh, and it primarily meaning is master. Uh, and it applied to the Old Testament scriptures, both to deity and to men. Uh, the later instances are distinguished in the English version by omission of a capital letter. So it's got a capital letter that's talking about deity. It doesn't have a capital letter talking about a man. And as applied to a man, the word is used for of two relationships, master and husband. An example of this is over in Genesis 24, 9 through 12. So let's just look at that real quick. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. And the servant took 10 camels of camels of, ma of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nabor, Nahor, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a wall of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. We'll get to this when we get to chapter 24. This is the famous story of when uh, Abraham sent his, uh, his uh, uh, servant, his number one servant, to go, go find a wife for uh, his son Isaac. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So in this case, this is Adonai used in a, uh, in a master uh, human ma uh, male kind of a way. We're here in uh, uh, as we saw there in, uh, in Genesis 18, 12 I put to put 18:12 in there. May illustrate the former uh, here in Genesis 18:12. I guess get that verse real quick. I don't know why I didn't put it in here. Genesis 18:12. Therefore, Sarah laughed with herself, saying, "After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my lord, being old also?" So there you see with a little L, uh, that's another example of it uh, being uh, standing for a man. In the passage I just read, it had to do with a master, same word, being used as master. Both these relationships exist between Christ and the believer, uh, which is also mentioned uh, uh, talking about master uh, in uh, the New Testament in John 13, 13. You call me master and Lord and you, and you say, well, for so I am. So here you can see the tie-in between the, the, the word is uh, both master and Lord. In 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3, it stands for a husband. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have exposed you to, my, to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is Paul speaking to the, some Christians. But I fear at least by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul's uh, mentioning here that, he's, uh, that uh, we're ultimately going to be the the husband. I mean the uh, the virgin brides to the our our Lord husband uh, Jesus. And that's all symbolic. Uh, again, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman in this case. And I said it's kind of a little hard. It's just more about the relationship, the loving relationship. It's not a uh, appropriation kind of a relationship that a man and a woman would have. So there's two principles going on here in this relationship of master and servant. The master's right to implicit obedience, as we read, uh, I was read there in John 13, 13, uh, just mentioning that, uh, looking at that again, you call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. Uh, this, is a, this is part of a passage that Jesus was reminding them that they of who of what, of who he was. But also in Matthew twenty three ten, neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And also over in Luke six forty six, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Uh, so uh, again, you can see that word is used. Uh, in both uh, representations. So at least for, for that one, for Adonai, 
uh, it really depends on whether it's a capital L or a little l. And also the servant's right to direction and service. That's another there's a responsibility from the master to the servant. And we see that over in Isaiah 6, 8 through 11. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. <laughs> and he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then said, I, Lord, how long? He answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without men and the land be utterly des desolate. That's something that uh, God was telling to, uh, uh, I'm not sure who in this particular, I think it was probably Elijah. Or Isaiah, I should say, you know, to Isaiah about something he was going, a message he was going to give some people. I, I, probably they were backslidden. That's what I'm getting from it. But the idea behind the passage is that uh, as I, Isaiah, as a servant of the Lord, was asking for specific instructions on what he should do. Then we have that term Lord God, okay? And we add it into God, and that actually stands for in the Hebrew Adonai Jehovah. But when used distinctively uh, in this compound name, while gathering into one of the special meanings of each, will be found to emphasize that Adonai rather than the Jehovah character of the deity. Uh, so, so some of these following passages will help to understand this point of view. In Deuteronomy 3.24, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty work, and for what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to thy works, according to thy might. It's a way of, you can see here, this person is recognizing God as being uh, supreme and, uh, and that, uh, a loving father in a, in a way. And in Deuteronomy 9, 26, I pray therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thy inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through the goodness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. It's almost like a praise, in other words. Joshua 7, 7. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God you, we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan? Here Joshua is uh, basically asking the Lord, that. Uh, uh, so what's my next, What's what do I do next? It seems like that uh, we've been brought in to, for destruction <coughs> Excuse me. Judges 6.22 And when Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. It was like praise, like thank you, like uh, uh, I appreciate what you're doing for me. And also uh, kind of help me out. Give me instruction. Judges 16, 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O oh God, that I may be a vain, once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. That was that last plea by Samson when he was blinded. He wanted just enough strength to, uh, to kill the uh, Philistines that had put out his two eyes. If you remember from the story, that's the point where he actually pushed those pillars and had the building come falling down on, on himself too. Uh, but it was a last ditch effort to uh, complete the task that Samson had been called to. And also 2 Samuel 7, 18 and 2, 20. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. He said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me here to? So here's uh, uh, David is actually uh, asking the Lord for advice. And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this thy manner of, of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more about thee? For thou, for thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. And now, O Lord God, thou art thy God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. 
Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with the blessing, let the house of the servant be blessed forever. So you can see the praise kind of a worship kind of a uh, way of that particular passage. So that's how this term is used. And just a couple more over in Psalm 69.6. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be conf confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Psalm 71.5. Thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. So I'll give you an example of the, the use of the, the, the difference between Lord and Lord God. So I hope that was uh, helpful. I wanted to pick on that because I saw it in my notes, in my study guide, and uh, I thought that was a good place to uh, mention that. Since this, this particular chapter is actually pretty straightforward. So we'll get through the rest of it fairly quickly. It's almost like a plead here. Thank you for all you've given me. But what I really, but what, what uh, the reason Abraham is saying is, what I really need is a son. Uh, not really a complaint as God does understand and in a father, father loving way confirms he will get a son in due time. I haven't forsaken you. So at this point, God is going to do a covenant to seal the deal and give Abraham some peace. We're going to talk about this covenant. So let's just read through these next few verses, then we'll talk about covenants. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou shalt not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look, now towards heaven, and tell the stars if you can able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. They've estimated that, uh, that there's well over billions of billions of stars in the sky. And that was just, that's just an estimate. Nobody really knows how many there are. That's basically uh, what God is saying here. Is that you're going to have so much, so much, so many descendants, you won't be able to count them all. Continuing here in verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted of him for righteousness. So here's where Abram's faith comes in. He basically believes the Lord, and it's counted for him as righteousness. And I think that's an important aspect to keep in mind. I think I've already mentioned this once before. Uh, but that's really, uh, and I went through this when, when men became, a couple of lessons ago when I was talking about men started to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, that the, the, the way they uh, achieved salvation back then was not much different than they do we do now. That's what that verse is basically saying. Verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And now comes the covenant part. And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So that's what you see here. You always see the, you always see the ram and the uh, pigeon and the turtle dove uh, over here. There would be two other sets of animals. And basically, they're cut in half with a pathway in between. They don't cut the birds in half. They just lay them along the side. And this is an ancient way of performing a, uh, a solemn co covenant. Uh, they're basically that, uh, and I'll explain it here in a minute, that if you go back on your word on this, it's, it's death. That's the symbology of the death of the uh, animals, is that if you break this covenant, that yeah, it can also uh, mean death for you. So they basically come in after, they put them in, like that picture shows, they put them opposite each other, like you see, except for the birds. And Abraham knew exactly what to do with these animals. He understood that according to the custom of his time, God told him to get a contract ready for signing. Basically, that's what it is. In those days, contracts were made by the sacrificial cutting of animals with a split carcass of the animal lying on the ground. The covenant was made when the parties to the agreement walked through the animal's parts together, repeating the terms of the covenant. So we're going to see the Lord do this exact same thing here. Let's continue reading. Verse 10. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Okay. 
And when the fowls came down into the carcasses, Adam drove them away. So he kept the, uh, the vultures from coming down and eating them. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know surely that thy seed, now this is God speaking, uh, and he is doing, the, he is performing the covenant, but he's doing it by himself without Abram walking with him. And he's, and here he's repeating the covenant uh, as they as would, that uh, if it was both him, uh, both of them together, they are repeating the covenant back and forth to each other. In this case, God is doing it alone because it's an unconditional covenant. It's God is making the covenant and he won't go back on it. So here he goes talking about it. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, shall serve them, and, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom thou shalt serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And they shall go to thy fathers in peace, they shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation thou shalt come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Basically, he, uh, God is saying that uh, the reason you haven't had a son yet is because you're not quite ready for it yet. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So I think that, the, that this is the smoking furnace and this is the lamp. I also think this is symbolic. Remember, this picture also covers Sodom and Gomorrah. So I think that's what this is uh, depicting here, uh, is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll see when we get to that. And that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So to finish off here, uh, so literally the Lord cut a covenant. Uh, we see here that even though this land God had promised has never come completely under Jewish control, and it won't until the Millennium Kingdom, but this for sure will happen as God has promised this promise and not a single promise God has ever made has not happened. So let me show you this uh, it's kind of what I was showing you there here. But let me show you a better map. Uh, than that too. Hold on one second. Okay, it's not in there. I forgot to get that one. But this is the same area. I guess I had a better map. I oh, got it somewhere. I had to reboot my computer and I thought I got all the stuff back up again that I wanted. Uh, but uh, it's like I missed the one. This kind of shows it. But I just don't like that big wording in the middle. It kind of distorts the uh, picture. Of course, now I can't find it.
Okay, well. Oh, you'll be seeing it again. You can, you can basically see it here. Uh, basically, it's from the Ruby Euphrates up along here to the Nile River. And basically from the bottom of the uh, Euphrates to the bottom of the Nile River and the, and the, and the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So this whole area belongs to, uh, uh, is going to, it was what God has promised to Israel and they've never had it. And so far, they only had this little piece in here. Okay, I really wanted to show you that one now because it showed the difference between now and then. Let's go back to the other picture. I'll just leave that one up there for now. Uh, I also want to show... I believe I lost that picture. Oh well, okay. I guess that's the best picture I had is the one I was showing you. Uh, there on that uh, picture here. This Israel right there. And then this shows the uh, Mediterranean and then the uh, Euphrates River is over here. So basically that area, that whole area is the promised land that God is promising. So let's finish up here. So here, uh, also in Jeremiah 34, refers to the same uh, practice of a covenant made by cutting animals or repeating the oath. So I just read through this in Jeremiah to kind of show you how typically it worked. Now I will give the man, the man that has transgressed my covenant, which I have not performed, the words of the covenant which thou hast made before me, when thou cut the calf in twain and pass between the parts thereof. So like I was trying to describe, normally if there's two men having a covenant together, they would both walk through the, uh, between the two animals and would be stating back and forth to each other what their, what their, uh, the, the promises were, uh, the deal they were making, whatever it might be. Typically for land or some kind of a big purchase uh, or some kind of a business deal, it was done quite often. So Abram knew about this and knew it. Uh, Kind of goes back to the old idea of the uh, of uh, your word is your bond. You know that uh, you hear about that in the old west, where pretty much a handshake, uh, a handshake between two men was a sealed uh, uh, decision that you would not go back on. Now you got lawyers and stacks of paper to try to keep co uh, uh, covenants uh, in place. The reason I want to read this one is it says what's the uh, uh, what the uh, what happens if you don't keep it. And the princes of Judea and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land, which pass between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the trials of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. What Jeremiah is talking about here is somebody who went back on their covenant. Uh, so after, basically saying after they had gone through and made the covenant by walking through the animals, they went back on it. So that God was going to give them over to their enemies. Uh, and and here, they, here Jeremiah was talking about the entire nation of Israel. So the symbolism was plain. First, it is a covenant so serious that it's sealed with blood. Second, if, if you break this covenant, uh, the same bloodshed be poured out on my animals and me. Uh, and in this particular case, we're talking about God here. Uh, so obviously God isn't going to die. So I think the one thing you can make for certain is that what it's basically saying is that God, uh, this will come to pass. Uh, there's no way that anyone's going to break it. So when you hear these people that try to uh, say that Israel, uh, you know, has been replaced by the church or that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, they, they gave up on their on their promise from God by, by not accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
when God made this covenant, uh, he, didn't have, he didn't put any conditions on it. Uh, there was, uh, he made this promise that that land was going to go to the nation of Israel. And so it will uh, someday. And of course, based on Ezekiel 38, and I'm thinking that we're going to do something a little different in Sunday school. Uh, I think I'm going to move ahead into a little bit different extended study. I'm going to call uh, the, uh, <clears throat> oh, I guess I had it on the tip of my tongue. But basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the time of Jacob's trouble uh, and better known as the tribulation. And because we hit the point of time of the Antichrist, and that uh, I may continue that right into the uh, uh, the millennium age, and when uh, and when this covenant actually gets fulfilled. So we'll see. Uh, I've been thinking about a lot lately, of finishing off Daniel by by extending and talking a little bit out of Revelation and uh, Ezekiel about the uh, about this period of time known as the time of Jacob's trouble. So basically what's happening here is that God is going to do this covenant and he's basically saying uh, to Abram, let's sign a contract and settle this once and for all. So uh, Abram knows that by God doing this, there is no way that God is going to go back on his word. So some way, this old man, uh, Abram, is going to have a son uh, out of his loins. And uh, this is what gets into the whole uh, Sarah and the fact that they had a child, Isaac, at uh yeah, Abram was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. Now, this is before that. We'll get into that when we get a little bit farther into Genesis. And so because God alone uh, stated the conditions of the covenant and passed through the split animals meant it was the responsibility of God alone. And nothing would change that. So it's one of the few uh, unconditional covenants. Now, similar kind of a covenant uh, is what uh, Jesus has with us. Uh, is that uh, if we, if we, uh, well, and it's it's somewhat conditional, but the once once we've made that decision, uh, that it's sealed uh, with the blood of Christ. So, just finishing up here, verse nineteen. Then it goes through these cities, and some people like to try to take that map I had up there and change it into something a lot smaller. And so God, to finish off this covenant here, mentioned the cities that are going to be replaced with Israel. And that's what we got here in these uh, next few chapter, few verses. The Canaanites and the Kizzites and the uh, Kenamites and the Hittites and the Pizzites and the Rehimes and the Amorites. Yeah, let me get my other picture up there. So you can see the Hittites. Hittites are up there at that particular time, but they are down here more. Uh, <clears throat> they're actually over here. The Amorites. I tried to find a good map to show it all, but basically they're in this general area. Here I can kind of uh, draw the, because uh, the Nile River is right here, and it goes over to here, which is the start of the Euphrates, and the Euphrates goes up into here and goes around and back over to the Mediterranean. So you see it gets into the Hittite area a little bit. The Hittites are no longer up there. Uh, that's pretty much all of Turkey. Uh, but uh, they did come down uh, and there were more in this area during uh, Abraham. <clears throat> but you see the Amorites here. And these are some of the places that uh, when uh, uh, Abraham left the Ur of Chaldeans right here, he, he went up through here and back around here. And you remember he went into Egypt and so that's how God decided. He said, every place your foot has gone is going to be your land. That's another thing he said. And one more verse here. And the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites. So that ends that chapter. There's just one other interesting prophecy. I guess I'd run through real quick uh, in the hair that uh, is kind of hidden in there. It's in verses 13 through 16. Let me just read it again. And he said to Abram, Know surely that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that's not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Keep in mind four hundred years there. Some people ask what the, uh, what the Bible says is a generation. There's actually two places that talk about generation. So this is one of them. And also that nation whom they shall serve will like judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. 
This is talking about the 400 years that are going to be in Egypt. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Here's the key. It says here, but in the fourth generation, there shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. <clears throat> so it says the fourth generation. So here we have 400 years and fourth generation. That's That comes out of 100 years per generation. So I just thought I'd point to that. Uh, that, uh, that a lot of people talk about, because over in Matthew 24, 34, Jesus mentions this term, and some people use this as a uh, timing uh, sequence uh, for what could be a, the approximate time of the tribulation. And it says here, Verily, this is Jesus speaking, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And most people believe that's the, uh, when, the when Israel started regathering itself back into the land. That happened in 1948. That generation would not pass away until all things are fulfilled. That would be the tri entire tribulation. And a lot of people like to use this verse over here in Psalms 90:10 uh, as a generation. The days of our years and our three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet as their strength, labor, and sorrow for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So the days of our years or in our generation. Those numbers work out to either 70 or 80 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we got at least two places that, that sta state a different generation. And there's even one more besides that uh, that says 120 years. Remember when, uh, when Abraham was told uh, that uh, he'll make a, a man uh, to be uh, 120 years. So I know Jesus said that, but it's kind of hard to say, uh, to use that as a time thing, because it's going to be anywhere from 70 to 120 years. So I thought I'd just throw that in there. Uh, it's a little interesting side note about a biblical generation. That's what it's called. So let's end with a prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord, so much uh, for this time. We got to look in your word. And thanks again for all you do. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'll talk again tomorrow, again in chapter 16.